Consider the octopus. He's no mammal. He doesn't even have a backbone. And yet he commands a public popularity that your average rat or even orangutan could only dream of. The secret to the octopus's success? Its brain. This incredibly weird structure from our biased vertebrate mammalian perspective. The brain is the result of an evolutionary process, hundreds of millions of years removed from our own, creating an organ that looks on the surface nothing like what we've come to expect a proper honest brain to be. And yet, there it is, flagrantly producing behaviors we prefer to associate with vertebrates. Researchers say cephalopods, a category that includes octopus, cuttlefish, squid, and their living fossil cousin, the nautilus, have demonstrated quick and complex learning, a capacity for decision making, and even controversially, tool use. Frankly, octopuses are freaking amazing. Hidden in their fabulous brains are lessons scientists are only beginning to tease out about the evolution of the human brain, the nature of complex behavior, and the brain architecture underlying consciousness itself. So this is the first question that everybody always asks. Naturally, the answer is insanely complicated. We'll start at the beginning. Aristotle here thought that octopuses were stupid. He based this opinion on the fact that if you went down to the ocean and stuck your hand into the water and shook it around like you were trying to do the hokey pokey, an octopus would sidle on over to check out the action, making it really easy for you to catch and kill and eat said octopus. Now on the one hand, Aristotle kind of has a point there. But when you think about it, what that octopus is actually demonstrating is less suicidal ideation and more innate curiosity. It wants to explore. It wants to know what the heck an Aristotle is. Which brings us to the other end of the spectrum of opinion. And Paul the octopus. Soccer fan, ostensible psychic, and recently declared enemy of Iran. Neither moronic blobs of protein nor clairvoyant supergeniuses. The truth of cephalopods lies somewhere in between, and scientists have been trying to get at it for more than 50 years. The first real research on cephalopod behavior and intelligence dates to Italy just after World War II, when a gaggle of British zoologists gathered in Naples. There, I'm told, they found an ample supply of the necessary components of their research, wine and octopuses. Out of this laboratory came the first mapping of gross anatomy of the octopus brain, as well as the first basic demonstration of octopuses' ability to learn and remember information. But the really fascinating thing to me about this research was who supplied the funding. Neither good booze nor healthy octopuses come cheap, and the Naples team kept both flowing with money from the U.S. Air Force. So what would the Air Force want with octopus brains? The answer seems to be computers. According to a 1997 article in New Scientist, the Air Force was interested in the science of learning and memory in general, hoping it could open doors to better computer design and robotic systems that could learn. Now, ultimately, the scientists at Naples couldn't untangle the cephalopod brain enough to really help build better computers, but they did begin a line of inquiry that's taught us a lot about the functionality of cephalopod brains and how brains in general work. Intelligence is a loaded word, and cephalopod researchers don't like to use it. And they have a really good reason. Um, you know, after all, what does intelligence mean to you? Uh, IQ tests, grade point averages, the ability to communicate via spoken language? One thing is certain, intelligence makes us think of human stuff, people things. And that's not fair. An octopus doesn't need to be able to pass a written exam. It never has. To judge animals against human ideas of what intelligence means in humans is to miss the point of evolution. Our brains are not this private club that the rest of animal kind is trying to be cool enough to get into. Every species has adapted, over millions of years, to have a brain that allows it to be smart for its particular niche. Octopus brains can get octopus jobs done, and they don't have to worry about whether they can tackle human issues. Your octopus will not do your homework, but that doesn't mean it's stupid. These kind of semantic issues come up a lot in the world of cephalopod studies. Another great example of this is the concept of observational learning. Uh, the basic idea here is that an animal can pick up a concept without having to be explicitly taught, that it can learn from observation. 
Now, you might do this if you were a guest at an unfamiliar religious service and you watch the people sitting next to you in order to know when to stand up, when to sit down, when to kneel. There are some researchers who say that cephalopods can pull off observational learning. For instance, Jennifer Basil, she's an associate professor of biology at City University of New York, Brooklyn College, and she told me about a recent study by French researchers where wee baby cuttlefish, still curled in their translucent grape-like eggshells, were shown different kinds of prey. Now, normally, baby cuttlefish are well known for an almost unalterable preference for shrimp. The researchers took clutches of these eggs, though, and exposed them, some of them to those tasty shrimpy treats, others to crabs, and some to nothing at all. When the babies hatched, the ones that had seen crabs went after crabs. The others shunned the crabs in favor of shrimp. To Basil, this is an example of how cephalopods might alter their behavior and learn by watching their prey animals. It's especially important for creatures like cuttlefish and octopuses, which aren't social species and aren't taught proper behavior by their parents. And she says that that could be an example of observational learning. But Roger Hanlon, a senior scientist at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole, says that that doesn't fit with the generally accepted definition. He says that observational learning isn't just learning from watching any animal and not even any prey. It's about watching, learning from watching other individuals of your own species. Think back to humans again. If you're looking for a bathroom and the doors are labeled men and women, you can learn which to use by observing the clues in your environment. That's learning, but it's not observational learning. Finding a sign and following its directions is very different from the mental gymnastics needed to watch other humans going into separate doors, recognize what sex they are and what they're doing differently based on sex, and connect all of that back to your own problem of trying to find a bathroom. Now that's my own rather scatological example, but it's similar to the distinction that Hanlon is trying to make. There's a difference between a cuttlefish seeing potential prey that humans place in its environment and the process of watching another cuttlefish attack prey and learning just from watching that, that the prey is good to eat and how one might go about eating it. So again, language matters. Calling cephalopods intelligent just confuses things, but what should we call them? It is absolutely true that there is something very different and very exciting going on in the cephalopod brain, especially when you consider its nearest relatives. Cephalopods are closely related to mollusks, and their family reunion would feature such dignitaries as snails and oysters. These are not big-brained creatures. They can't navigate a maze like a cephalopod can. They can't react quickly and change their behavior to reflect minute-by-minute -minute changes in their environment. And with a couple of notable exceptions, they don't seem to be able to remember information and use it in the future. In the nature and in the lab, invertebrate cephalopods act more like vertebrates. Researchers describe this special class of conduct as behavioral plasticity or behavioral flexibility. A layman might go ahead and call it intelligence. I'm just going to call it being awesome. Awesomeness starts with decision making, something cephalopods excel at because they are delicious. Everybody, or anyway, every marine carnivore, wants to eat a cephalopod, and the cephalopods don't have much going on physically to stop that, so they've had to learn to be wily. They've developed this toolkit of defensive responses ranging from squirting out ink to moving quickly in little jets of water blasted out of their bodies to an incredible ability to change their color and texture and literally vanish into the background. But if you have all those options available, you can't really use them to your best advantage if you're just stuck in a reflexive, instinctual escape mode. You have to be able to look at the specific situation, weigh the possibilities, and make choices about the best kind of escape. And cephalopods can do that, to the point that it's a little freaky. Roger Hanlon told me about a great demonstration of this ability. He went down to the Caribbean and started swimming around toting a camera with a bunch of octopuses on a reef. He did that long enough that the octopuses got used to him being there, stopped hiding in their dens, and started going about their normal foraging activities, which is when Hanlon attacked. He went after 15 different octopuses, striking at them over and over like a predator, but with a camera. 
the octopuses all started out camouflaged. Now that's just how they go about their day, which makes sense because they're incredibly good at blending in. But when their camouflage failed, their tactics became completely unpredictable, as in literally, when analyzed later and broken down into statistics. But that wasn't what really got Hanlon's attention. Instead, he was excited about this one particular behavior where an octopus would swim backwards away from him toward handy places where it could hide. When it got to one of these spots, the octopus would squirt out a jet of ink in one direction and dive away in the opposite direction, immediately changing its camouflage to match its new hidey hole. Basically, it was giving him the old dodge and faint routine. Now think about everything an octopus had to do to process that. While swimming for its life, it had to know where Roger Hanlon was and where the next hidey holes were. It had to think about the timing to trick Hanlon with the ink squirt, and it had to know what color and texture to turn its skin as it dove away. All of that pretty much at the same time. That's broad awareness and complex decision making done at high speeds by a creature with a mollusk brain. Verdict? Awesome. Now, let's go back and talk about that camouflage thing some more. This in itself is an incredible ability. You know how when you were six and you learned about chameleons and you assumed that that meant you could stick a chameleon in front of any background and it would immediately match, you know, plaid, neon blue, lame, whatever. And remember how disappointed you were when that assumption turned out to be wrong. Cephalopods, as it turns out, have those kind of camouflage abilities we always wanted from chameleons. They can match color with near perfect accuracy, they can also match texture and patterns. And better yet, when they don't want to blend in and disappear, they can actually create moving patterns on their flesh, like some kind of living jumbotron. They're able to do all of this because their skin coloration system is completely different from anything else. For instance, humans and other mammals all have skin color controlled by melanocytes, these cells that produce a pigment called melanin. Your skin color is determined by how active your melanocytes are. So very active ones produce darker skin. Lazy melanocytes get you pale. Sun exposure can also trigger melanocyte activity, which is what we call a tan. Now contrast that to cephalopods. Instead of melanocytes, they have something called chromatophores, basically bags of pigment like uninflated balloons. Other animals have chromatophores, including chameleons, but only cephalopod chromatophores are joined up to an intricate system of muscles, nerves, and neuron bundles, all of which makes the chromatophores easily and intricately controllable. Chromatophores really do work like pixels covering the cephalopod's skin. Their body becomes a billboard. They don't just use these things to hide. They can also use color change to communicate. For instance, one really common behavior among both octopuses and cuttlefish is what's known as a passing cloud formation. And basically, uh, you get this series of dark lines that starts at the cephalopod's head and moves all the way down its body to the tips of its tentacles. As far as anybody can tell, the passing cloud formation is meant to startle prey and trick them into moving while the cephalopod itself remains still, reducing blur that might otherwise cause the ceph to miss its dinner. It's not a very friendly sort of communication, but it really could be communication, the cephalopod equivalent of sneaking up and going boo. Even more impressive, they can send multiple messages at the same time. If you take a tank, and separate it out into three segments, and you put an octopus in the middle, something the octopus likes to eat on one side, and another octopus on the other side, you'll see the middle octopus put on two different displays. One, the side of the body facing the prey will show the passing cloud formation. The side facing the other octopus will take on a pattern, color, and texture that conveys tough guy status, basically saying, don't you take my shrimp, I will beat you. That posturing can diffuse tense situations as well as create them. Researchers have actually documented cuttlefish having little pattern offs that take the place of actual physical fighting. There's also some really interesting debates going on as to whether cephalopods may even use tools. Again, this is a big area where semantics matter. There's a lot of different legitimate definitions for what tool use actually is, so scientists can disagree until the cows come home, but if they're using different definitions, they aren't gonna have much luck convincing one another. For example, according to James Wood, director of education at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California, a conservative definition of tool use 
might be an animal using a solid object to solve an immediate problem rather than just to provide defense against potential predators. Think about chimpanzees taking a stick and using it to catch tasty termites in a mound. By that definition, there aren't any real clear examples of cephalopods using tools. But Jennifer Mather, who is a professor of psychology at the University of Lethbridge in Canada, favors a different but still valid definition. She calls tool use the act of taking an object and modifying it so you can alter some aspect of your environment. And she has an example of octopuses doing just that. So octopuses kind of have houses. They sleep and hide in these dens, like crevices in a rock, for example. It's an important part of protecting themselves from predators. Back in 1991, Mather documented octopuses in the wild collecting rocks and taking them back to their dens. And then, once the octopus was inside, it would wall up the opening to the den by stacking the rocks in front. Voila, privacy fence. In fact, Mather said the octopuses tended to do this not just to immediately escape a predator, but as a precautionary tactic before they went to sleep. Now to her, that's tool use. Other experts disagree, but you know, frankly, even if you don't think it's tool use, the behavior still demonstrates the cephalopod's ability to be awesome. So where does all this awesomeness come from? Make no mistake, cephalopods have big brains, larger than any other invertebrate, and compared to body size, well up the size ladder on the vertebrate scale as well. In terms of processing capacity, they're packing upwards of 500 million neurons. Now, that's minuscule when you compare it to our 100 billion, but it's pretty good for a non-primate. Cats and dogs, for instance, are also in the 700 million club. The weird thing, though, is that those 500 million neurons are not all in one place. What you see here is an octopus brain. Kind of. That caveat is a big part of the weirdness going on. Benjamin Hockner, professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, is regarded as the top cephalopod neurobiologist, and he separates the cephalopod brain into three parts. This is the first part. That's the central brain of the cephalopod. It contains about 50 million neurons and is located in the center of every cephalopod's head wrapped around its esophagus. The second part is actually two parts, the optic lobes. They're behind the cephalopod's eyes, but outside the rest of the central brain. And there's about 80 million neurons there. So that's 130 million neurons accounted for. Where are the rest? All over the place. Here's where things get interesting. Cephalopods are invertebrates, and one thing invertebrates tend to do with their neurons is cluster them in distributed patches called ganglions all around their bodies. If you've ever wondered about the most humane way to kill lobster, for instance, uh, Jennifer Basil says it's boiling, killing the whole thing at once. Lobster have ganglia, and cutting it in half, she says, would just create more or less two very uncomfortable lobsters. Now, cephalopods, with their central brain, aren't like lobsters, but they do have ganglia and associated neurons running throughout their bodies, especially their arms. Two-thirds of a cephalopod's neurons are part of this peripheral system that runs along each arm. And this division of labor says a lot about the nature of the cephalopod brain. On the one hand, you have this dense lobed brain tissue, like the stuff that makes vertebrates awesome. On the other hand, you have invertebrate architecture running parts of the body in ways no vertebrate can easily comprehend. The cephalopod peripheral nervous system is a great big hairy deal, very important to the way they live. These ganglia aren't separate little brains, each off doing its own thing. Don't make the mistake of thinking cephalopods have some kind of multiple personality disorder going on. Instead, Ganglia function as a way to speed up processing when it comes to motor skills. According to Benjamin Hockner, the central brain sends a command, and the distributed ganglia work out the details of creating complex movements. And these movements are very complex. A cephalopod has eight arms, each covered in suckers, as many as 300 per arm in the octopus. And these suckers are not inert. The octopus is not your bath mat. Suckers do the work of taste and smell, and each and every one of those things is maneuverable on a fine, detail-oriented scale. The suckers can work alone or together, an octopus can pick up an object and then move said object up its arm by having rows of suckers work in series to pass the object along, like some sort of team-building exercise designed by H.P. Lovecraft. The central brain just says, 
I want that. The ganglia handle the coordination that makes it happen. Fascinatingly, this might not be the only kind of distributed processing going on in cephalopods. Think back to those camouflage abilities, especially their skill at color matching. Now consider this. Cephalopods are colorblind. So how the heck does that work? Scientists have long known that cephalopods have light reflecting skin cells, which allow the creatures to display colors taken directly from their surroundings, even if they can't detect color themselves. But Roger Hanlon thinks he's found another possible explanation. Based on everything we know about color perception, cephalopods really are colorblind in their eyes. But recently, Hanlon and his team published on a surprising discovery. Out in the skin, far from the eyeballs, they found the active gene that codes for the exact same light-sensitive opsin molecule that's found in the retina. Normally, you'd only find that gene active in the eyes. That could mean that cephalopods are sensing light with their bodies, as well as with their eyeballs. Now, that still doesn't answer the question of color vision, but it provides a possibility. So far, Hanlon and his team have only looked for the gene signature of one kind of opsin molecule. It could be that other opsins, tuned to different colors, are hanging out out there as well. Another possibility is that opsin molecules might interact with the multicolor pigment-filled chromatophores to somehow create a sense of color. Right now it's all speculation, but it's really interesting speculation. On a micro level, the cephalopod neurons themselves are also really invertebrate-esque. Now, what does that mean? Well, vertebrate neurons look like this, what's called a multipolar neuron. Dendrites pick up chemical signals and convert them to electrical ones, which pulse through the cell body and down the axon. At the axon terminal, it's converted back to a chemical signal, and the process starts all over again in another neuron or muscle cell. Invertebrate neurons, on the other hand, are usually unipolar, according to Benjamin Hockner. Cephalopod brains use this kind of neuron. They work the same, but the electrochemical impulses bypass the cell body entirely. The axons are also usually very long compared to multipolar neurons and lead all the way back to the nearest ganglia or to the central brain. If you put an electrode into a cephalopod neuron cell body, it wouldn't pick up much of a signal. Now that wouldn't mean information wasn't being transmitted. It just would mean the job is being done in a really different way at the little level of the dendritic tree remotely from the cell body. Another thing that's different is the myelin sheath covering the axon, or in the cephalopod's case, the lack thereof. With vertebrate neurons, myelin provides electrical insulation for the axon, similar to the plastic coating on a copper wire, and it allows electrochemical signals to travel much faster than they otherwise could. In effect, myelin cuts processing time by shortening the time it takes information to travel from one spot in the brain to another. And cephalopods don't have it. But they're clearly quick thinkers, so what gives? Evolution has provided a couple of solutions. First, what you can't build insulated, you can build big. Squid solve the problem by growing bigger axons. The larger the diameter of the axon, the faster the signal can move. Squid have some axons that are so large they can actually be seen without a microscope. These giant axons help squid respond quickly when it's time to jet away from a predator. The other solution to cephalopods neural communication problem is part of what makes their weird brains start to seem a little more familiar. Remember how most invertebrates have series of ganglia clumps of neurons instead of centralized vertebrate-style brains. In cephalopods, some of these ganglia seem to have joined forces. Their lobed central brains and visual lobes, which look at first glance to be made of the same stuff as vertebrate brains, are, in fact, densely packed in vertebrate ganglia. The difference in processing speed this packing applies is akin to the difference between a highway linking a chain of small towns and a neighborhood in New York City information can travel faster in a smaller space. And that's what allows the cephalopod's central brain, in particular a part called the vertical lobe, to process information quickly. Another similarity with vertebrate brains is the use of long-term potentiation. Essentially, LTP is a phenomenon in the brain where a signal passing from one neuron to the next beefs up the connection between the two, making it easier for the neurons to communicate in the future. As you might expect, it's an important part of learning and memory. The more you practice a certain skill, the more efficient the neural connection becomes, and the better you can remember that skill later. Now with vertebrates, one part of the brain where this happens is the hippocampus, 
which is associated with learning and memory. And it turns out that the cephalopod vertical lobe seems to take care of some of the same functions as the vertebrate hippocampus. In fact, this connection between the vertical lobe, learning, and memory is one of the earliest discoveries made about the relationship between cephalopod brain structure and behavior, dating back to those English researchers in Naples. There, scientists found that if you cut out or lesioned an octopus's vertical lobe, then the octopus would lose its ability to build new long-term memories. It might still fumble its way through a maze, but sans vertical lobe, it lost the ability to get better with practice and remember the route later. What we're looking at here is a clear case of convergent evolution. Vertebrates and cephalopods haven't shared a common ancestor in 500 million years. Our brains evolved completely separately. And yet, somewhere along the way, cephalopods got to some of the same functionality using some solutions that are similar to ones used by vertebrate brains. It's fascinating. And it's not a unique process. The cephalopod and vertebrate eyes are also the products of convergent evolution. Like us, cephalopods have an eye that works similarly to a camera, with a lens projecting an image onto a retina. But they got there in a completely different way. And we can tell because of fetal development. With vertebrates, the eyes grow on stalks, reaching out from the brain. And cephalopods, the eyes start as a clumping of cells on the surface of the skin and reach backwards into the head to make brain contact. More important are the hints this convergent evolution whispers about how to make an awesome brain. The cephalopod brain presents us with a second distinct model for what an awesome brain can look like and how it can function. As Jennifer Mather put it, if the cephalopod brain bears any relationship to ours, it's not because we evolve similarly. It's because that's just how intelligence works. Being awesome seems to mean having a dense processing system and the ability to preferentially enhance connections that are used repeatedly. It also means finding a solution for making your processing happen faster, but the cephalopod model suggests that there's more than one way to do that. All of this has big implications when we start thinking about how we might design artificial awesomeness in our image. Cephalopods have already played a role in our quest to understand the organic brain and create something similar. Take those giant axons that allow squid to make fast getaways. It was the study of giant axons that provided the first crucial information about how electrical impulses in brains, ours and cephalopods, are generated. Another example, those intricate octopus arms controlled by a combination of the central brain and distributed ganglia. Benjamin Hockner is currently participating in European research aimed at developing a flexible self-maneuvering robot based on octopus neurophysiology and behavior. The goal is to produce a robotic system where a central processing unit compiles sensory information and sends commands to periphery processors, which do the work of actually moving the limbs. Hockner thinks this system will be easier to control. Basic movements can be embedded into the distributed processors, and when an order comes down, creating the right complex response becomes simply a matter of combining a series of simple movements. Simplicity is really the name of the game here. Human brains are ridiculously complicated, and copying them doubly so. But if what you're trying to do is create a system that can engage in some basic awesome behaviors, Cephalopods provide a model for getting to that functionality in an easier to understand package. So there's some concrete headway going on now. Really the first since that first big burst of cephalopod brain research petered out in the 1960s. Today, researchers are making serious progress on answering the big questions about how the cephalopod brain works, how it relates to behavior, and what all of this tells us about how brains work in general. But to reach those ultimate goals, to use the simpler cephalopod model as a back door to creating awesomeness, scientists say that the research will have to get a lot more interdisciplinary than it currently is. Part of what's held this research back, and what still limits it today, is the fact that individual scientists tend to focus either solely on the behavior or solely on the neurobiology. There isn't a, not a lot of overlap. To get some more clear and usable answers, that gap will need to be bridged. Essentially, we'll have to do what the octopus central brain itself did, bringing distributed ganglia together to form something that can think bigger and think faster.